So this is case one. Um, it's a 68 year old female with a dorsal foot nodule that was excised. Then you can see that it was a, a very circumscribed nodule situated in the subcutis. And it has some zones like this that are very pink and collagenized with bland spindle cells arranged in elongated uh, kind of parallel fascicles. And you can tell that the, the cells have um, a very wavy kind of a ramen noodle shaped uh, or instant noodles, I think maybe they're called in Australia. Someone told me on, on Twitter, um, uh, these little fibers, collagen fibers in between the spindle cells. So that's usually a sign when I see um, spindle cells with no, or uh, with either a little bit of blue cytoplasm or indistinct cytoplasm and with wavy collagen fibers in between that probably we're dealing with something fibroblastic or myofibroblastic. Um, and see there, you can see it again. So that's, uh, when you, when you see that, I like to call that the ramen noodle sign or the instant noodle sign, uh, which my former fellow Ed Fulton came up with. So we have these kind of fibroblastic appearing fascicles, very bland. Then over here, we have much more cellular blue uh, areas. The nuclei are larger, they're more hyperchromatic, still very uniform and monotonous, really no pleomorphism to speak of at all. And in, uh, in these areas, uh, you can see that the elongated fascicles are kind of intersecting with each other at sharp angles. And that's a, a pattern, a, a subtype of fascicular pattern that we like to call the herringbone pattern. Uh, now, in the olden days, that was kind of synonymous with fibrosarcoma, which is a, a diagnosis that we don't really, uh, really ever use by itself anymore in modern soft tissue pathology. Only in very select settings uh, we use that. And we also know that uh, herringbone pattern can be seen in a variety of entities. So I went through that list of entities, which includes malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, synovial sarcoma, sometimes melanoma, uh, cellular schwannoma, and I tried to think what this lesion might be. And it was negative, if I recall, it was negative for SOX10 or S100, and uh, a panel of other, uh, you know, keratin was negative. Uh, really, uh, it wasn't positive for anything useful except this is CD34. And you can see it's strong, diffuse, positive for CD34. But morphologically, I wasn't really sure what to do with it. You might think a little bit of solitary fibrous tumor because we have some dilated kind of staghorn vessels. And solitary fibrous tumor can get fascicles uh, as well. And I can't honestly recall if we tried STAT6 in this case uh, or not. I just remember I did a panel of stains and I ended up with kind of nothing I could really uh, wrap my head around. Because if we look around the whole periphery of the lesion, it's again, very circumscribed. There's uh, no trapping of uh, adipose uh, tissue. There's no story form change. Uh, it's really just these fascicles of uniform hyperchromatic uh, spindle cells with occasional mitotic figures. So my best thought was maybe could this be like a weird fibrosarcomatous dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP. And um, the only thing about it is it's, you know, it's on the foot, which is uh, certainly possible to have DFSP on the hands and feet. It's, it's been described in, in the literature, um, and I have seen occasional cases in the digits or the hands and feet, but it's certainly not a common sight. And also, most of the time when there is fibrosarcomatous, you know, cellular herringbone pattern uh, DFSP, if you have a big enough sample, you will almost always see some areas of classic conventional story form fat trapping DFSP um, next door to it. But in this case, it looks like the, pretty much the entire lesion has been shelled out here. And we have a very nicely, uh, you know, pseudo encapsulated, very well circumscribed lesion with not a hint of anything that looks like DFSP. So I sent this off to, to my friend, Dr. Julia Bridge, um, uh, who I send most of my soft tissue molecular testing to. Number one, because she is a, a molecular guru who actually invented and discovered a lot of the, the fish and other molecular findings that we, that we uh, use and understand about soft tissue tumors. And also because she's a, a brilliant morphologist as well, and she'll take a look at a case and, and have some ideas and sometimes really has, uh, has guided me in what additional molecular testing I should do in ways that helped me to solve the case. And uh, this is only one of, of the examples that I will show you today. And we went on to publish this together uh, with some other colleagues. Uh, so in any case, what this, uh, I did the um, fish for collagen 1A1 uh, and PDGFB, and it was negative. And I thought, well, I don't know what else to call this. And uh, Julie said, uh, you know, maybe we should try PDGFD, which is a, a relatively recently discovered um, alternate fusion that can be seen in a small subset of 
of uh, uh, DFSPs that lack the traditional collagen 1A1 PDGFB. So I said, well, I guess we should give it a try because otherwise I don't know what to call it. And lo and behold, it was rearranged for PDGFD. So um, she had a, had a case not uh, not long before that of conventional uh, DFSP. And then we had this case, which I call a pure fibrosarcomatous uh, DFSP because of its cellular herringbone fascicles. Even though it's not terribly mitotically active, I, I certainly thought this fit better for fibrosarcomatous pattern uh, DFSP rather than conventional DFSP. And so we published those two cases together um, in 2020. Uh, and uh, you can go check that out in the literature, I think in the journal Cutaneous Pathology uh, uh, 2020. So um, I don't have follow-up on this patient yet. I would imagine, I think we recommended a re-excision and uh, uh, just to make sure it was uh, widely clear. And uh, hopefully this patient will have a, a good outcome because it was small and circumscribed. Uh, so a really interesting case because the patient was older than the traditional patient. The uh, anatomic site was unusual and uh, the uh, uh, classic DFSP features were not there. And then also, usually we talk about um, fibrosarcomatous DFSP as having the herringbone fascicles and oftentimes loss of CD34. But I think this case highlights to me, you don't have to have loss of CD34. Uh, to me, that, that you can have CD34 still in fibrosarcomatous DFSP. Although I think it's important to know that when you see a CD34 negativity in DFSP, it tends to be in ones that are cellular herringbone and fibrosarcomatous. Also, sometimes a mixoid DFSPs can lose CD34 expression. So I think those are some important caveats to remember. So I thought this was a really fascinating case. And now, um, you know, in general, I personally feel comfortable diagnosing DFSP on a classic case on H&E with maybe a CD34 um, and sometimes also an S100 to make sure I'm not getting it confused with a diffuse uh, neurofibroma, which can have fat trapping and a honeycomb pattern. But other than that, I really feel pretty comfortable making a diagnosis of DFSP when it's classic, just on a very basic uh, uh, workup, you know, of those one or two immunostains uh, or even just uh, H&E in a classic case. In difficult cases, I will, will refer to uh, FISH, particularly when I think it's probably not DFSP, like I've got a bland CD34 positive spindle cell tumor that has a little story form pattern or a little fat trapping, and I think it's probably not DFSP, but I can't see the whole lesion or I'm not sure. Then I'll use uh, FISH for DFSP to make sure I'm not just to make sure that it's really not. And that way they can manage the patient conservatively and either watch and wait or do a small excision. Um, and then the other time I use fish is when I'm pretty sure it is DFSP, but I only have a small sample and I can't see the periphery of the lesion. And before I send them to do a big surgical excision or Mohs, uh, I want to be sure. Uh, and so those are the kind of times I tend to use molecular, either when I'm pretty sure it is DFSP, but I want to be 100% before doing a big, potentially morbid surgery, or when I'm pretty sure it's not DFSP and I just want to be sure before uh, before I leave it alone and, and have it come back and recur, you know, with uh, with the problems for the patient later. So um, when and also when I do DFSP fish, I tend to do PDGFB and collagen 1A1, and if that's negative, I like to reflexively go on to do PDGFD now because of these occasional uh, exceptions to the rule. And I uh, suspect that as more and more people start testing for PDGFD, we will see a growing number of these cases reported in the literature.